Welcome to School of Fish, Keaton Nankinville. How are you, my man? I'm good. How are you? Um, for those that don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm rocking the Wisconsin sweatshirt today to my fellow Badger here. Uh, show some respect. Um, but uh, Keaton and I got to know each other uh, in the last year. I had been monitoring some of the stuff he was uh, posting and working on at Alumni and Bascom Ventures, where he's set up today, and uh, was familiar with him uh, from his days as a member of the uh, of Wisconsin and the Wisconsin basketball team. So, uh, Keaton would love to hear maybe a little bit about it, your background and share with the audience. Yeah, um, thank you, first of all, for having me. This is pretty cool, and I don't really get a chance to do much of this stuff, so it's, it's an honor and always fun to do it with a fellow Badger. Uh, my background is... I don't know. I'd say pretty typical of like a kid who grew up in the suburbs. So I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, home of the university. Um, for anybody that went there is from the area, you can't really help but be uh, a, a big Badger fan. I mean, I, I grew up not realizing that there was other ways to live other than like with Wisconsin flags on everything and, uh, you know, all the gear. Um, because of that and because you can't tell on Zoom, but I'm, I'm six, eight. So I was just born a big kid. Uh, I got into sports really young, really followed that passion um, as far as I could. So I, I grew up in Madison, had the chance to play, uh, was offered a scholarship as a freshman or sophomore in high school to play for Bo Ryan, who's like a Hall of Fame level coach. The team was perennial top 10. I think the year before I actually got on campus, they were number one in the nation with Alondo Tucker, Cam Taylor, um, Brian Butch, all those guys. It was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. Um, also as a kid, because sports played such a big role in my life, I like coaches and teachers were a big deal to me. So when I went to school, um, I originally went to be a PE teacher. I wanted to teach gym coach. That was kind of how I was going to spend my career after college. And, uh, I actually never, com I did complete that degree, but I originally didn't complete my degree. Uh, I was on a five-year path, finished my four years of playing and was offered a job overseas to play professionally, something I never thought would happen and i didn't plan for it um, but took it as it came spent five years playing around europe um, after my fifth season came home and was kind of forced to retire by injury and um, pretty shocking thing when you spent your life kind of gearing up to do one thing the best 12 15 years of your life really focused on one thing and uh, so i was just kind of floating around madison i took some time to finish my undergrad degree i'd say it took me 10 years to finish my undergrad um, and it just so happened that at the same time I was doing that, there was a guy who was friend of a friend starting a small VC firm in Madison, super community based. It was, um, kind of a novel structure. And I, I learned this later. I didn't know it at the time, but kind of a novel structure where they raise capital from individuals to do a pool fund, um, invest out of that fund and create a diversified venture portfolio. This was a model that had kind of been proven on the East coast at some of the Ivy league schools. And the, the parent entity, Alumni Ventures, was pushing west. Uh, UW was kind of the first public school and then the other Big Ten school, Northwestern, same year. Um, I had no idea what I was getting into, but he said, you're not doing anything. Um, this is a chance to learn about business. It's a chance to get reintegrated with fellow Badgers. Would you like to help me out as kind of an unpaid intern? And I was like, yeah, I got no idea what else I'm going to do. And so I took him up on it. I worked with him for a few years, tried to hang around as much as possible. Eventually, uh, it motivated me to go back and get my MBA. So I completed that and then joined the firm full time. There happened to be uh, an opening the year I graduated. Um, it was also the pandemic. So, you know, I joined a VC firm, a, a fast growing VC firm during a fast growing VC time. And that was pretty intense and, and fun and a great way to jump into the profession. And uh, within two years of me being here, we're going through a much different market circumstances. So it's been a wild ride. Um, I've enjoyed it. And yeah, it's, it's a story that's still unfolding. No, it's great. And you're, you're set up in Chicago right now. That's where you're, you're working out of, right? Yep. yep. So still, uh, still in the Midwest. I have a hard time leaving. I love it here. But Chicago has been a great experience. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's the famous book by Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers, where it says something to the effect of spending 10,000 hours doing something, you become a master of sorts. 
one thing that I feel like I'm a master of is is Wisconsin sports. And it is a it's a great feeling to be able to dive into a conversation that, you know, stretches between one of my loves in life, which is Wisconsin and Wisconsin sports and business and entrepreneurship. So I really appreciate you kind of coming out today and, and sharing your background. Um, coming from Madison, as you kind of alluded to, uh, Wisconsin seemed to be like a no brainer uh, school for you to attend. Was that something that when you got that offer, it was like, you know, signed, sealed and deliver, or there was an ounce of, let me just see what other programs are out there that may be interested in, in, in yeah. joining them. Um, it's a little of both. I think deep in my heart, I always had a feeling Wisconsin was the way forward for me. It, it was just, um, it fit with what I wanted, but the story is more complex than that. Um, as a high school player, I had a high school classmate of mine who went to Marquette, uh, an AAU teammate of mine committed to Marquette. It's another good in-state school um, who was, I mean, really top level program at the time, also perennial top 25. Um, there was part of me that wanted to explore that. And I also had family out in Boston, Massachusetts. My stepfather lived out there. Um, we used to spend you know, a portion of the year out there. And I had interest from Boston College. And so those were kind of my three. But at the end of the day, um, it was part of me as a young person being indecisive and partly trying to be too nice and not hurt anybody's feelings. Um, the truth was, is they all, I think, knew Wisconsin was where I was leaning. I, they must have heard it in the way I talked about it. Because the pitch at that time was, what do we have to do to pull you away from Wisconsin? I said, I didn't, I didn't even tell you I was leaning that direction. They just knew. And I think there was, uh, it was probably pretty obvious that that's where I was going to go. And, and then I saw in high school, you ended up in 2007 being named Mr. Basketball in the state of Wisconsin. So what, what did that feel like? What did your, in, in high school, how well did your team do kind of, you know, let's say senior year? Ahead yeah. of we, uh, I was really fortunate. This is kind of the story of my career uh, through sports and, and so far in, in the business world is like right place, right time with really good teammates is kind of how I've progressed through my life. Um, as a 12 or 13 year old, 14 year old, whatever it is, freshman in high school, I walked onto a team that went on to uh, compete in the state championship my, my freshman year. We had an incredible team lost in the state final. Second year, uh, my sophomore year, that team won a state championship. Junior year, we went back and lost in the state final. Senior year was probably our biggest letdown. We lost in the quarterfinal, um, but always had really good teams. So it was like part, it was getting scooped up into like this great program. And winning Mr. Basketball is like a byproduct of that. It's the same thing you see with any good player, good company, good CEO. Like the truth is it's always a byproduct of a lot of stuff going around you. And I've been, I've been super lucky to be the right place, the right time, good programs, good companies, that kind of thing. And, and, and during the recruiting process, you know, Bo Ryan, that the time you, that you were in Wisconsin, 2007 to 2011, in some ways was like the middle period of his tenure yeah. at the school. Uh, talk to me about what it was like to be recruited by Bo Ryan and ultimately play for what we all would agree, Wisconsin fans and beyond is you know, one of the best college basketball coaches of all time. Yeah, he's a he's a brilliant guy. Um, I think like a lot of high school players, you know, the recruitment period is is a little bit. Uh, yeah, they're, they're selling you. They're, they're giving you the like the beautiful version of everything. And don't get me wrong, Wisconsin was beautiful. But <laughs> what they don't tell you about is how intense every day is. So to get recruited was, it was interesting. Uh, I'm not a person who likes a lot of attention and fanfare. So honestly, it, um, I thought Wisconsin was great because they, they didn't try and dazzle anything up. They were just honest. And here's, you know, here's what going to school looks like. Here's where you're going to live. Here's where you're going to train. It was, it was very straightforward. It, that just resonated with me. Um, interestingly, Bo, obviously, is the head coach who was part of the recruiting process. But the main guy recruiting me was Greg Gard, who's the coach now. So I got to know him. God, what is it, 15, 18 years ago, um, you know, he was at a, a much different point in his career. So it's awesome to see him doing so well playing for those guys. I mean, like I said, you just you don't appreciate the intensity day to day. And um, 
you know, another example of kind of riding the wave of success. You, if you hang around smart people, you learn a lot. Coach Ryan is a brilliant basketball mind. I learned a ton playing for him. Um, the guys that I played with, they all came from different backgrounds, a lot of them from the Midwest, but like different styles, different learnings. <clears throat> playing with those guys was incredible. And then a lot of us that go on to play overseas, you know, keep building that experience, but we'd like all connect with each other overseas. And it's like this nice little community, uh, a fraternity of, of Wisconsin basketball players. Yeah. And uh, I was looking back at your four years and I don't remember there being any two, two successive years for the Wisconsin basketball team since I started going there in 1997 or when I enrolled then uh, that were never not great teams, but uh, you guys had a pretty amazing run. Uh, talk to me kind of about your journey in the Wisconsin basketball program from yeah. freshman year where um, I think you guys had a memorable NCAA game against what would turn out to be one of the all time greatest basketball players, yeah. Steph Curry. Uh, but just walk me through freshman year and kind of how things evolved as a basketball player at the university. Yeah. It's, it's like the only, it's the kind of thing you can only see in hindsight. So it's a fascinating journey. I'd be lying. Like it was a real struggle. I think a lot of players go through this. It's such, it's such a big adjustment. Um, despite all the support systems the university has, like at the end of the day, you just have to, you have to be able to figure some things out. It takes some people longer than others. I was one of the ones that had a little bit of a longer cycle. Um, my freshman year, just getting up consistently, getting to the weight room, getting to class. I'd never fallen asleep in a class. I, you know, I was like dozing off in classes and just exhausted. And I didn't, I didn't even play. And, you know, that's, that's how intense it was. Um, on the court, my first, my first road game ever in my college career was at Cameron Indoor versus Duke. We got beat by about 30. Um, we had an awesome year. I played with guys like Brian Butch, Mike Flowers, Greg Steemsma. Um, memorable game from that year. This is all me watching from the bench, by the way. Memorable game from that year is Mike Flowers uh, hitting a three, I believe, at Texas to go up in the last few seconds, then stealing an inbound pass and throwing it in the air, something like that. Or maybe it was just a steal, but it's like mm -hmm. just this incredible play. Um, won a piece of the Big Ten title. Won the Big Ten tournament. And then went to the NCAA Sweet 16, lost to Steph Curry. Talk about like uh, lucking into lucking into good program momentum. I mean, that my high school career was good. Um, had always been part of teams that were like kind of competing at championship level. Like as a freshman, I was like, go to college and be on a championship level team for sure in the Big Ten. You know, not nationally that year, but like pretty amazing. Um, my sophomore year at Wisconsin. I started for the team, but I was like a young starter. And, and with Bo, what he likes is, is continuity. So he kept me as a starter the whole year, but my minutes were small. So kind of thing where like I'd get um, pulled out of the game early for kind of a sixth man or something like that. I think John Lure was coming off the bench. So not a not a bad player to come off the bench. Um, but mentally, it took a lot of time for me to develop. You know, I had less than five cumulative minutes on the court my freshman year. And then with starting my sophomore year, there's a big learning curve. Um, I hate the feeling of letting my teammates down. So there were moments where um, I could tell that I wasn't pulling my weight as a, as a player and I'd get really frustrated and down on myself. Um, it was a challenge. We had some bumps that year. I think we had like a five game losing streak, which hadn't happened <clears throat> maybe Bo's whole tenure at Wisconsin to that point. But still, um, overall successful year by anybody else's standards. Finished top four in the Big Ten, two rounds of the NCAA tournament, pretty good. Um, came back with a, a little bit of a renewed focus. Uh, we had a really big class. So this was our junior year. There was six of us in the class. And I think we all, with the seniors also, just like pushed really hard going into our junior year. And the team we came together, we kind of filled all the roles that had left matured where we were, you know, lacking before <clears throat> and had another successful year, top 10 finish in the big 10. Um, another two rounds in the NCAA tournament, but, but overall really successful, great learning experience for me as a player, got more comfortable with how to play the game at college, 
grew into myself kind of physically, which makes a big difference. And then uh, the thing that nobody can explain is you go into your senior year and you go, man, this could be the last time, like my last basketball season. And so again, with a big class, we were super focused. We came in really hard, had some great talent in our class, like really good players coming up behind us that had continued to mature. Then our senior year, um, we played really well. Uh, don't remember how we finished in the Big Ten, struggled in the Big Ten tournament, interestingly, and then went three rounds in the NCAA, NCAA tournament, lost to uh, Butler, who had been in the championship the year before. So wow. overall, you know, leave with four pretty good years of experience. And as a Wisconsin fan growing up and then a player, you get a little spoiled. But I realized that going to the NCAA tournament four times is like not something most players do in their career. That's and amazing. So I, I look back on it pretty proud. And when you kind of think about the lessons you learned as a college athlete that, you know, now you carry over, <laughs> um, but I know professional basketball, but into let's call it the, the startup world or the investment world, what do you, what do you draw from most as a player on a team and the individual role amongst the team that's relevant to, to your work that you're doing today? Yeah. I think there's a few things that like, they permeate everything I do. One like striving towards excellence and everything. Like, you know, while I was playing, I wanted to be as good or better than Michael Jordan. It didn't happen. It might not have had, there might've been other constraints, but like, that's the goal. Be excellent at what you do so you can contribute to your team. Like I wanted my teammates to always be able to rely on me. It's a quality that I think you can sense in people um, no matter what their field. If they're a teacher, like, you can feel when somebody is just, just has like this eye toward excellence. We actually, I just moved into a new place. We had it repainted. Our painter didn't have an eye toward excellence. I find it like super frustrating. <laughs> and so like, these are things that exist in every field in every person. Just, are you willing to put the focus, the intensity into it? Um, and really like the joy that comes along with that, like doing something to your, the best of your ability. Um, that's one, two, the pursuit of larger goals is something I loved as a basketball player. It's something I look for now. A lot of my peers in venture capital, they come from like these incredible consulting backgrounds or, you know, just deep finance knowledge. They're gifted in mathematics, technology, something like that. Um, that's not the game that I can play. But what I do know is I have a sense it's, it's super qualitative. You can't measure it necessarily, but I trust my gut when I meet founders that I sense are not, you know, I want them to have a, an eye towards you know, operational excellence, of course, like we just talked about, but like the ones that are looking for a larger goal, I think that when times get really hard in a company, which inevitably they do, that's what pushes you over the hump. You know, our startup is struggling. It's scary. We're low on resources. We don't know where to sell next. We don't know who to turn to for help. <clears throat> if I meet a company that's like working for climate change, that's what pushes them over the hump that those days. And so I think it's a really important quality. I also think it attracts like-minded people and, and like-minded talent. So some combination of like striving for excellence and then higher, some kind of higher goal that I think those two things, um, intangibles, but they're what I, I look for a lot when numbers and strategies are really ambiguous in our field. Right. And, and I, I would love to hear, get a, you and I talked once before, but you know, I've, I get a lot of emails through the years from alumni ventures and particularly Baskin ventures as a graduate of the school, give us a sense on kind of, you know, the mandate at the alumni level and then at the micro level, yeah. uh, what you're focused on with Bascom. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, it's an interesting model. Like I said, I think it's novel uh, for sure that we've made a big impact in the venture world by kind of approaching it differently. The historical, paradigm in, in venture was you'd raise a large fund, a large pool of money from endowments, um, other financial institutions, pension funds, maybe some super wealthy individuals, but they had to have like $10 million check to get into these funds usually. Great. Uh, they're super successful. They prove that this industry works investing in early stage stuff. And then there's a separate ecosystem of uh, angel investing, kind of the individual 
you know, high net worth individuals is classified the SEC, which is million dollar net worth or something, you know, some salary um, constraint. They can invest as angels, you know, small blur checks, you know, not insignificant for the individual, maybe, but like twenty five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, friends and family, things like that. It's a really great field. There's a lot of opportunity to create value at that stage if you if you find the right companies, but it's also really risky and really challenging. Angel networks, you know, what's any individual's expertise that they can, you know, vet a company properly, assess the risk. Um, can they find things out of their own geography, out of their own network? It's just really, really challenging. And so there's a bunch of individuals that are missing out on the ability to create value in the private markets. And so our founder created a mechanism to solve for that by pooling a bunch of individuals' capitals and, and having it managed by a professional team and small funds. He did it by localizing around school alumni affinity. Dartmouth, like Wisconsin, has like this really ravenous alumni base. So he raised capital from Dartmouth alums, found companies with the Dartmouth connection, invested in them. There's enough good companies that are connected to Dartmouth in one way or another that there's you know, big opportunity to make venture returns there. He expanded the model to Harvard, MIT, Yale, all these schools that you'd think. And then eventually, like I, I mentioned earlier, came West and Wisconsin was on a short list of schools that had enough founder talent, enough capital, you know, big enough for a successful enough alumni base that there's capital available to invest and an interest in, in what's happening. I was really excited to hear that and was like proud that Wisconsin was on that list with all these Ivy League schools. That was something I wanted to fight for. So, um, like I said, I joined as an intern and the model's the same here as it was at Dartmouth. Raise capital from Wisconsin alumni, find companies with a connection. We use the word connection pretty broadly. Um, the way I look at it is I just want to stimulate kind of the activity happening from Badgers. And that means could be a founder, could be an investor, could be a board member, it could be a service provider. Um, you know, how, how are we helping people that are involved in this world or connecting people and then ultimately benefiting our investor base of Badgers by finding these great companies? Um, so yeah, the, the mandate is pretty simple. We create a diversified portfolio. That's the product we offer our investors. Um, we do an annual fund vintage, so we raise annually. That's why you see all the emails. And because we raise from individuals, we have to get a lot of communication out there. It's a model that takes a lot of legwork, a lot of visibility. It's one of the most common things we hear is like, oh, I've seen your emails. Um, I get it. And, you know, good. We're glad people are seeing them and, and looking at venture capital and interested in innovation. And um, we're really proud to be able to provide this service, this product to people so that they can get a taste of it. Yeah, no, the company that Wisconsin's keeping as part of the, the, the network, you know, all the Ivy League schools I was looking today, UCLA, right, Berkeley, University of Texas, Northwestern, uh, MIT, Stanford. So yep. uh, and I and I and, and, you know, you hear this terminology community in so many segments of the startup world, the investment world and other places like how does uh, alumni and Bascom really leverage the network once yeah. you've let's say made an investment. So I'm a, I'm a founder, you know, I let's say went to Wisconsin or have, you know, an affiliation, uh, Bascom invests in my company. What is kind of the community network effect that yeah. Bascom br brings to the table? Yeah. One thing is, so this is, I'll say this first cause it's important to the second part of the answer. But one thing that we do that's I think helpful and hopefully, um, kind of a good value proposition to our investor base is we only co-invest. Um, we're, we're looking for diversification and we understand that you have to have expertise in every field to make a sound investment you know, choice as a lead investor. And so we only co-invest. Um, we, we write typically smaller checks um, and we want kind of exposure to a number of industries, a number of geographies, a number of stages. The reason I say that is because then on the flip side, we've also had to hone in our value proposition to the founder. And I look at this like I look at a sports team. And especially when you get to the elite levels, you have specialists. There are guys who play in the NBA because they can just stick at three, you know, and that's like such right. a specialty. There are guys who like can't shoot. You think when you get to be a pro, you can't shoot. You can't really dribble. But I'm such a good shot blocker that I need to be on the court. 
we are trying to become the best co-investor in the, in the world. I was going to say the country, but the world. And that's like, it's a role that we take very seriously. Everything we do is built towards that. And the network is kind of the biggest value add. Every company, you know, especially the good ones, they can go find money. That's actually not that hard when you're kind of the one being chased. Um, but what's really hard to find is the right team providing that money. And so we look for lead investors that the founder is really enthusiastic about when we, we follow in. The lead investor will for sure provide a industry specific or like a relevant network and they'll provide more hands-on operational support. What we do is bring breadth. So equivalents like that three point shooter, we're like, we're the specialist in a breadth of network and it's who do you need to know? Um, because we have now 20 funds across different institutions and we've been in the market for a number of years now, our audience is about 600,000 people. We say that's the people who get our newsletters or on our social media are aware of what we're doing. And as you can imagine, because of the alumni bases, there are a lot of people that have seen success in their life in different ways. A founder can come to us and say, hey, I need to meet the VP of international expansion in, I don't know, enterprise sales, something. And with some, some specificity like that, we can go, okay, here's, a, here's these four people in our network that would be helpful and we can connect you with them. Um, some people go, I have this product. I'm a, this is a portfolio company of ours. I, I'm a travel product. I'm looking for other young companies that are kind of innovative in travel tech. All right. Well, actually our sister funds have invested in five of those already. Let's connect you to all of them. <clears throat> and so what we do is we do a lot of, all of our services are built to connect dots like that. And it's, you know, for our, our check size, we're low friction. I think it's something founders appreciate and the ability to add value. You know, it's kind of a win-win where they don't have to, deal with us too much and we can provide something on the other side that's of use to them. Right. And, and especially now it sounds like you've been there about two years, right? Plus or minus. Yep. Um, it, it will be interesting to kind of now start building your, you know, continuing your career in venture at a time when there's definitely a lot of, you know, mini chaos that's out there, whether it's tough for people to justify, you know, valuations or bring new capital in or whatnot. And, Founders are definitely going to need support and help. And yeah. what's kind of like the internal um, mantra or talking points when founders come to and you just know that they're going through a, a challenging time right now? Yeah. Either at, you know at, at either lo level, either the parent level or or Bascom's level. Yeah. How are you guys uh, approaching uh, what's what you know what's pending in the market or people talk about pending in the market? Yeah. The number one thing I think I do it in the the person I work with who's much more seasoned than I am, he was a founder for a long time or kind of an executive for a long time. We, and he has taught me, we recognize how just lonely it could be to be a founder in these circumstances. Like I think good founders, they're not good founders, but certain cultures have a thing where they can talk to their other executives, maybe their full teams, depending on the relationship, but also you have to balance this thing like a coach you can't come in and, and be buddies with your players and then have to go like kind of put your foot down. It's, it's a hard relationship to maintain. And as a manager, you know, of course you maintain a good relationship with your employees, but you can't share every, you know, every insecurity, every fear with them because you're also leading an organization. It's probably a really fine line to balance. I think what, you know, first what we want to do is recognize that like, man, that's tough. Uh, we understand. I don't understand. I've never been there, but like, I hear you that it's hard right now and just know that like we're here if you need to just get it off your chest and brainstorm. We don't have all the answers. Um, my colleague Greg has far more answers than I do, but we still don't have all the answers. I think sometimes the best thing we can do is listen, you know, just they know that there's somebody they can vent it to that's not in their organization or not their spouse or something like that. Right. Right. Um, we're basically putting the word vent in ventures this year. Yeah. Funny too, right? Yeah, there's a reason. Both of you there, right? Um, yeah, and then secondarily, like if an, if there's an opportunity, who can we who can we connect you with? You know, is there somebody that's been there that you want to talk to? Is there somebody that would help with a very specific need right now that would get you past the sticking point? That's what we try and do. You know, there's only so much money can do to solve a problem. We're not the we're not the firm that writes the big check anyway, and um, there's a lot of other things we can do to just ease people's various stresses and anxieties, I'm sure. Right. 
And um, how do you just, you know, my world is business development, use the terminology, connecting the dots, bringing people together, having a vision, sounding Mm -hmm. board, listening. It it definitely resonates with what I'm doing every day. Yeah. Um, How are you approaching, like now that you're in, you know, in in this new world, um, networking and building relationships? Does it help that you're in a place like Chicago, as an example, because there's a pretty, you know, growing, rich um, network that's there yeah. of of companies and investors. Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, Madison was a, it's a growing tech scene. So it's to start there pre pandemic and it's a great place because it's big enough that with a little time, you can wrap your arms around it pretty well and know what's going on. You can keep an ear to the ground pretty thoroughly. And then people are really supportive moving to Chicago. And for me moving during the pandemic, it was a little challenging. Um, I'm actually more like, I more prefer the Zoom world because I, I like the opportunity. If I'm in a big networking event, um, I can find those interactions often to be superficial. With Zoom, I got a half hour of your time, me and you. And as long as we can get connected, you know, as long as we logistically can set this thing up, undivided attention for 30 minutes. And I really enjoy it. And it's actually allowed me um, for sure to meet people in Chicago. But how else would I have gotten connected with you, people on the West Coast, people down South, um, people in... India, Europe, Asia, it's amazing. So I actually really enjoy it. And I find Zoom for me to be a better front door to building relationships um, just because we get to hone in. And I, I've really, I've actually really enjoyed it. And it's nice to be back in the more social stuff, but I always take the more social stuff and parlay it into let's get connected and, and spend a half hour on Zoom. I just find it to be really, really useful. Totally. And your personal brand awareness is pretty significant given, you know, you, you just being a high profile athlete in the state growing up playing on the basketball team. And now almost 10 years later, there's a lot of brand value that you've created by being on TV. And I'm sure all the the community stuff that you did through the years. Hopefully. I mean, the, um, another lesson I've learned and I'm still learning is like, it's good to leave a trail of kindness. Um, I've, I have found that that has helped me 10 years later. You know, you meet somebody you say, Hey, taught my kid at a basketball camp and you were nice to him. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's good. That's how I want to be remembered. But it's also funny. Um, it's been 11 years since I graduated. So it's time is time has gone by. The good thing about Badger fans is they have really great memories and there's a lot of pride. Um, but yeah, it's nice. It's nice to be in community for that reason and to be able to meet people and have people kind of remember something about you. Right. And it, when you're six foot eight, I'm sure in person, the first question you've been asked your whole life or since you've been that tall is, yeah. do you play, what team do you play for? Do you yeah. play basketball? Right. Yeah. That's the age old question to a rather, you know, to a tall person. Yeah. Um, so true. it must be nice to, even though you probably embrace that, to be on a Zoom and nobody really be able to size you up, no pun intended, yeah. for being six foot eight and, you know, having that, that history. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Yeah. I actually like the question too. So I'm happy with either one. Right. It was a running joke during COVID was when you meet people on Zoom and you don't know if they're tall or short or, you know, Anything. big legs, small legs. Or yeah. big. And it is a funny uh, spoof. We've always said when you meet someone for the first time in real life, having developed a relationship on Zoom. Absolutely. Uh, and you're like, wow, you're tall, you're short. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're on the extreme end of that of that uh, analysis. So yeah. To say. Uh, no, and and Keaton, what's like the the best way for people um, to kind of engage with you? Is it? Um, I was asking this before, but just for everyone's benefit. Yeah. Uh, founders should reach out to you directly. Founders should reach out to Bascom at the you know at the kind of in- inquiry level. Uh, you know, capital sources. How do you want to engage with maybe people that? Otherwise, we're not familiar with you and, yeah. and, and alumni or basketball. All of the above. Um, again, part of, part of the benefit of being a specialist and like a co-investor in the way we are is like a big portion of my job is build a network. And um, at the end, I think it serves everybody that I'm connected with. You know, if, if I can connect you with a founder, if I can connect a founder with another founder, if I can connect uh, an investor with you, who knows what. It just benefits everybody. You know, there's a network effect to it. The more value there is in the network, the better. Um, 
if, if you're a founder, for sure, reach out on LinkedIn. For sure, reach out. We have, you know, a, a way to submit your deck or your business plan, whatever, to a, a portal. And we get all those. Um, I take it very seriously that I, I review all those, make sure that, you know, everybody gets a fair shot of being seen. We, you know, we have a strict investment mandate, but that doesn't mean we don't take a look at everything that comes through. And then, um, yeah, I mean, if you get on our newsletter, if you reply to that, it will, it will get to us eventually. But I encourage, I encourage everybody. I think the beautiful part about being in the Wisconsin network is the kindness. And, and so I encourage anybody to reach out to us and, and the various platforms and it's, it's our job to respond and do the best we can to be helpful. Totally. Uh, and then you, you know, just kind of a couple final questions, like the, uh, the brotherhood that you were able to form as you know, an athlete on your team, the teams through the year, high school and college. Yeah. Does that, do you feel like that's uh, been kind of a cornerstone of the relationships you've been able to build? Do you still keep in touch with former teammates and, yeah. um, just just talk about that a little bit yeah um what i didn't realize until i was done unfortunately is that you like building that type of relationship like going kind of a season is defined length defined goal we want to win a championship and it it lasts it's, it's a project it's a one-year project and i spent my whole life in that paradigm and i didn't realize how that like brings people together, builds the character of a group of people, creates a culture was like I said, really lucky just to be part of good cultures and, and be along for those rides. It's the number one thing that I, and almost everybody I talk to when they're done playing miss is like, I, I could care less about going out and shooting or being in an arena with fans, um, a locker room, especially in basketball where it's like 12 to 15 guys, it's small enough that it becomes like a family. Uh, the experiences I shared with teammates overseas, like this is stuff that people in my life back home never got to see in person. And so like, those are, they're just like unique things that I have with this really small group of people. It's super powerful. I do my best to stay in touch. I'm, you know, all of us get busy and like eventually when, yeah. when is anybody people, else, is anybody else working? Sorry to cut you short in the, no. in the venture world, like any More. former, teammates of yours from overseas or from the US? More founders. A lot of guys okay. go into starting companies. And I, it makes sense. Athletes are ambitious people. They're driven people. I think they have kind of like that entrepreneurial bug and whether they whether they find an idea they want to chase or not is, is a different question. But I see a lot of people founding companies, which is awesome. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, and then one question I didn't touch on before that I am curious your take is just this whole, the whole NIL movement. Yeah. Um, and um, particularly as it relates to Wisconsin, right? We know, yeah. use the word kindness. There's many attributes of Wisconsin. Doesn't always lend itself to being like a full hustle entrepreneurial yeah. school, you know, on the surface, even though there's a ton of success stories and it's changed so much through the years. Sure. What do you think is the kind of just overarching, you know, role that NIL plays for student athletes and particularly what's your vision maybe a little bit for a Wisconsin student athlete? Like how does this thing all come together and play out over time? It's a great, this is like a, a common topic of conversation, driving a bus back from a game in Germany <laughs> at like two in the morning. Cause all these guys, you know, we, none of us really experienced it. This is it's way behind my time. Um, it's a fascinating thing. I, I have no idea where it's going to go. Actually, I, I'm really just kind of curious to meet people trying to solve it in different ways. I can't tell if it's player driven, institution driven. Um, there's kind of this tension where players have, I think, more bargaining power in the moment, but they churn through a school in four years. The institution has staying power. So like, <clears throat> and of course the NCAA has kind of removed itself from all responsibility, which I think is challenging. There's no kind of governing body putting more guardrails on it. Um, specifically with regards to Wisconsin, and I can't talk for all the sports, but I know basketball, like I mentioned, Gardo was, he was my coach 15 years ago now. And, um, his ethics around it are, it's a secondary consideration. I think a lot of schools are recruiting based on that. Yeah. And a lot of players, um, and I get it, are enamored by it. And, you know, I don't know where the education comes from, but they have to recognize that it's, to 
there's a problem with distribution. You know, certain players are going to get a lot and that's a lottery. And if it's a distraction and you're a player who doesn't get that much, like, right. What's right. the cost benefit? Right. So I don't know. It'll be really interesting. Right. Wisconsin, sharing, sharing is caring should be yeah. uh, embraced, right? Amongst Wisconsin, teams. To your Wisconsin point. culturally is like hard hat. Let's just go to work and not worry about that extraneous stuff. Right. And we're in a time where like, we better acknowledge it because it can become actually a, you know, a recruiting red flag if, if a student athlete is like, oh, you guys don't talk about that. It's like the right. balance there right. is super tricky. Right. Totally. Um, all right. Good stuff. So, Keaton, this was a great, great conversation. Um, truly appreciate the time. Uh, definitely here to support you. And, you know, as I get to learn more about Bascom, you know, guys like me and, and my network, uh, I'm sure we'll be excited to hear this story, learn, learn a little bit more. And, you know, at the end, whether it's Wisconsin, whether it's, you know, graduates of universities, whether it's just society at large, like we do have to attack things and go after things together yeah. uh, and really be there for one another at a time right. when there's a lot of challenges. So um, thank you. Yeah. Man. Thank you for having me. And we'll, we'll make it happen. All of us together. All right, buddy. I'm Wisconsin. Yes, sir.